All right, everybody. Hey, hope everybody's doing well this Sunday evening. I'm welcome to the Note Nation Top 40 Tour. Uh, excited to have you guys here as we roll into Boston, Massachusetts to talk about what's going on in the market. But once again, everybody, uh, excited to have you guys all here. Welcome to the Note Nation Tour. If this is your first uh, foray into our 40 city tour across the country, we are excited to have you. Uh, we have a variety of local and national investors not only uh, jumping on here and watching this live, whether it's on Zoom, on Facebook Live, or catching the replay across YouTube and Facebook and the other social media players, but we're honored to have you tonight, today, this afternoon, this morning, whenever you're watching it. But we have a variety of existing real estate investors, but also brand new investors. And we're going to be discussing the statistics, the numbers, what's going on in the market right now, what you need to be paying attention to. And we'll talk about the second half outlook of uh, the year of 2020 and where things are kind of going. And we'll also talk about future opportunities, especially if you're a real estate investor in Massachusetts, Boston, other parts of the country as well. We'll talk about where to look for opportunities and when and where to get started for you guys that are looking to really capitalize on the craziness of what's going on right now. But uh, once again, guys, I'm Scott Carson, honored to be here with you tonight. Um, absolutely excited to be here with you guys. I'm so blessed uh, that we were able to do this virtually to really connect with everybody across the country. But for those who don't know me, I'm an active real estate investor and been one since 2002. I've uh, been a full-time entrepreneur since 2004, but I've been in the uh, finance mortgage debt market since roughly about then. Um, really focused, especially the last decade on buying distressed debt, distressed mortgages. I've done that about over a half a billion dollars in uh, debt for my own portfolio over the last dozen years. So yeah, I've been, been through one down cycle and an up, and we're going through obviously another down one right now too. Uh, my company's WeCloseNotes.com, and uh, you can find a lot of information about me there at WeCloseNotes.com. Uh, I've been working with real estate investors though and teaching them marketing, teaching them how to take advantage of the markets, distressed assets, distressed real estate since 2004. I am the host of a little podcast that's pretty popular out there called The, the Note Closer Show. It's syndicated across the country with millions of listeners each month. Uh, and I invest all across the country in roughly 30 different states. But Austin, Texas is home. Uh, I'll tell you one big thing if you don't know this already. I am a huge baseball fan. I'm so excited that baseball is getting started and looking forward to that. Uh, a little bit of normality if we best we can. But let's talk about what's going on in the market right now. Uh, and as we get into that, a lot of people are always curious. So, Scott, why am I doing this? Why am I taking time out of my busy schedule to spend time with you on an evening but doing it 40 times over basically 50 days? Because I love helping investors. It's one of the big passions I do. I have, it's I, my, one of my love languages is helping people solving problems. Uh, and I also believe though, that what's going on right now is a huge opportunity. Being somebody who's been through the last downturn, the Great Recession, who got in in 2008, was an investor. 2004, lost my ass in some deals back in 2002. I started learning real estate the right way in 2004, five, six, and an eight hit, taking a, a lump, but also rebounding strong to really capitalize on the market. I see a lot of similarities, I think we all do, to what happened over a decade ago. And I encourage you guys, if you're like sitting here, like oh, I'm just getting started or I missed out in the Great Recession and I missed out buying stuff at pennies on the dollar, do yourself a favor and realize that that opportunity is right in front of you right now again. Really, we are gonna see a big transfer of wealth here over the next 24 to 36 months. And it's all about what you do individually to take part in that, to carve out that piece of the pie, whether it's a crumb, but hey, I've made money on crumbs, millions of dollars in crumbs over the last uh, 12 years. And I, I share this with you because I was once a distressed borrower as well. As I mentioned before, back to 2002, there's a lot of good people going through shitty situations right now. And it doesn't mean them bad, it doesn't mean them bad. It just means that, hey, there's some opportunity to really do some good out there because there's nothing greater than helping someone overcome an obstacle or achieve a goal or dream that they thought was once impossible. For many Americans right now, that, that dream or goal is just to get a job or to stay in their house or to buy a house or they bought a house and now they can't afford it and they're upside down on it or will be very shortly. And that's one of the biggest things that I've prided our, myself and my company and my team on in the last 12 years is that we've really helped a lot of people not only stay in their house and do some amazing things, but also helping so many other people out there across the country new real estate investors tap into the debt space or people that are looking to get into investing and really make big changes in life. We'll talk a little about that later on. But anyway, I have a goal of the next 12 months to helping educate and helping a thousand real estate investors in the debt space. And I hopefully 
wish that you guys hopefully are one of those thousand as we get rock and roll because there's gonna be a ton of opportunities just gotta know when and where to do it and we'll talk about that stuff as well so our mission as a company is we help investors to accomplish their dreams and increase their wealth through debt investing not investing in debt but debt investing literally understanding what's going on in the market realizing there are opportunities in a downturn a lot more opportunities than in an upturn anybody can make money when the market's going up it's how do you act and, and what do you do when the market is in a downturn or in the toilet as we see it in a lot of places out there so i think the next 90 days the last 90 days have been very critical for many people trying to figure out where they're going for the next 90 to 120 150 180 days will be really really critical for many of us out there okay and i'm doing the best i can to get the word out on what's going on in the market there's so many opportunities out there that are going to come to us you just got to know where to look that most people don't know about okay so let's talk about what the national numbers say about everything well the national numbers say that unemployment is one out of every nine people 11.1 percent .1 unemployment rate in june those are numbers last year that's the national average there are 40 million people collecting unemployment right now and that number continues to climb uh 52 they expect 52 percent of small business are expected to fail Okay, and that number gets worse every month that this thing drags on. And it obviously varies by state to state, city to city, but that's still nationally across the board, 52% they expect to fall, that's fail. Uh, now, the biggest thing is that one out of 10 homeowners were already struggling to stay current before March rolled around. Yes, one out of 10 was already 30 days behind. Okay, now if you look at the national delinquency rate, the default rate is where they're at least three months behind. We're at 7.76, those were numbers just released a couple weeks ago. Uh, that's not very good, okay? Most of those people that were already a month behind, that were a month behind have fallen to two months to three months. And the, as I look at the numbers from the different places that we'll talk about tonight, that number is obviously gonna get worse, worse. Now, the thing to keep in mind too, is you think back to 2008, all the bank models were like, oh, we'll never hit 8% default rate. Well, yeah, we'll prove you wrong again. You're relatively soon. Currently, there are 4. million Americans currently in default. By default, there's 90 days in uh, non-payment. That number continues to climb. And it's another important thing to keep in mind, if you look back at 2008, when everything hit the fan, it took us 18 months, 18 months from 2008 to roughly into 2010 before we hit 1.6 million defaults, okay? Well, we're already two and a half times that in roughly a third faster the time, okay? We're not quite six months into this thing, but we're already at 4.1 million. So you, if there's all this rosiness and oh, everything's going to be fine, no, that not everything is going to be fine. I will tell you that right now. It will be fine for those that look and understand the opportunities. It's not going to be fine for a lot of people that get, will get stuck in the mentality. We all know when you're stressed, you don't make the right decisions. You do stupid things. And we're going to see a lot of stupidity happen across the country as people are stressed. People aren't going to react. They're not going to see outside of their own environment. And that's the opportunity for those to come in and really create win-win scenarios to really help a lot of people out in the long run, okay? We all know delinquencies record a high spike in two years. This came out a few weeks ago. Uh, the non-prime loans, which is the subprime loans, saw a 21.8% spike um, in June. Expanded prime loans charted at 12.2% spike. Reperforming had 6.4% spike. And whole prime delinquencies rose 5.5%. So you look anywhere between one and one in 20 and one in five, okay? Somewhere between that number, depending on what type of loan you had, you were really in serious trouble. You started to delinquent, okay? Oh, I mean, hang on a second here. I, this is important. I knew I screwed up and forgot to do one animation thing. Uh, let me fly in. There we go. Did I do that? Oh, I didn't do that either. Why did that not pop it up here? Hang on here. All right. All right, so, yeah, oh, right, here we go. Good, I got it. All right, so what do the national numbers say? We've been through this, boom, 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 boom. Okay, good. Um, we know that. Let's talk about what it's at in Massachusetts. Now, if you look at Massachusetts as a whole, the unemployment rate is at 17.4% as of June. Okay, that got worse, okay? A lot of the country and, and the different cities have looked at, oh, it dropped a half a point, it dropped a half percent, dropped 1%. In Massachusetts, it got worse. It got uglier from 16.6. And you can see from March, everything hunky door 2.8, 2.8, 2.8 to boom, 16.2, seven times. Uh, well, that's about six and a half times worse what it was. And then, of course, it got worse in May. And then even got worse in June. Now, you look at Boston compared to the Massachusetts, uh, Boston area, okay, yeah, 15.4%. 
So 15.4% unemployment rate right here. And you can see the average week raises and stuff like that. Um, you look at the rest of it, the Boston, Boston City in Massachusetts went from 2.3 to 14.4 over the same time frame the last year ago. And then you can see compared 14.4 is the unemployment rates. You can see the different aspects of it. Quin Quincy City, Massachusetts at 21.8. That's of April's numbers, okay? Boston's, uh, yeah, here you go. For Boston itself, 16.2 is what it is for May. And we know that numbers got worse, okay? That's sad. Almost one out of every five people is unemployed in Boston and Massachusetts. It's, it's really the worst part of the country, worst in the country. Number 17.4% in Massachusetts. You can see this came out July when? 17, which is what, today? No, sorry, Friday, okay? And they expect it to get worse. Uh, unemployment rate in June climbed to 17.4, the highest in the country. Um, the state jobless rate increased 0.8 from, uh, from May's market, 0.6, okay. Massachusetts is one of five states that rose. Rates declined in 42 others or stayed the same in another uh, three. Well, that if you have people that aren't going to work and it keeps getting worse, the jobs that are available are going to get snapped up or it's just going to be a worse situation. Well, what happens when people aren't working? They can't pay their bills, can't pay their car payments, can't pay their credit cards. They have to make a decision. Am I going to pay the power or the mortgage payment? Am I going to put food on the table? or am I gonna pay my mortgage? We all know what's gonna to happen to that. If you look at the foreclosure tracks, these are realty tracks numbers, roughly for in June, looking back at things. And you can see it right there in other markets. It's usually a light blue to a dark blue, okay? Now what they said, it's high. Basically, <laughs> this is the one weird thing it didn't show me, it didn't give me one in. It just said it was dark blue all over the place for Boston. There are high rates all across Boston there for everybody. And that's one thing I keep in mind. You're starting to see foreclosure rates. And if you look at the pre-foreclosures numbers, yeah, as of April, and you can see the trending, they've dropped down prior, versus prior month, versus increase for prior year. They don't have the numbers exactly yet because it has just stopped. Everything kind of, as you see, fell off the board in March there for April. May's numbers are at zero because why? Because the, state, the governor finally got smart and delayed things. Now, I think he had a bit pretty extreme delays on some things, and we'll get to that in a second here, but you can see from May to, there wasn't that much in May, Massachusetts is pretty good, but then everything just got, I mean, Massachusetts got bitch slapped, basically. It's really, really sad. I hate to say that, but yeah, foreclosure files have been none because you, they can't. You can't file, all right? And we know it's going to stay that way. In Massachusetts in April finally after everything was going on, after the federal government stopped everything for 60 days, Massachusetts kind of took its time, which is okay. They stopped foreclosures and evictions moratorium. And it's, it's not just for another 90 days. They got serious about it. And we could go back through this whole law, but we're not going to do this. So the most important part is mortgage foreclosure forbearance restrictions do not apply to commercial properties. In addition, for residential properties, a mortgagers principal residence of 1.4 creditors and mortgage shall grant to mortgagers a forbearance on mortgage payments for not more than 180 days, but at least 180 days. Okay. If they, you, you submit to the mortgage company, the reason uh, that you felt uh, if it's Corona delay, you've got a six month time frame there not to pay anything. Uh, and that's one of the things. Now that can also be dragged out longer if things can, can you go forward? So you think about it, this is April, that means end of October into November, hey, you basically don't worry about it. if you're coronated, you can go with forbearance agreement, okay? Well, we all know what's gonna happen, everybody. Forecast and anomaly of is foreclosures rise and mortgages sink underwater. This was April 16th, but we know that the first two dominoes, first three dominoes continue to fall, all right? Now, the thing is, one of the things that makes unique about Massachusetts is actually Massachusetts leads the country, okay? In this chart, debt by state 2020 had everything basically from the light purple to the like the red to the orange. The orange words are the most amount of debt per capita. Okay, and Massachusetts was very bright orange. And I clicked on it so it pulled up, but per capita, Massachusetts leads the country with the most amount of outside debt of mortgages of 11,000. Highest state number in the country. And I think Boston would probably lead that as a whole, because it's the major metroplex there in Massachusetts. No offense to anybody else out there. 
So you have a lot of debt that people have because they live in a desirable area. Now, what, what happens when they're not working? They're going to pay using their credit cards. Well, what happens when they exceed their credit card limits or the banks, which are been known to, and the credit card companies to contract the credit cards? To reduce, I would not be surprised if we have not seen this already, people getting their credit lines reduced. If you started using your credit cards a little bit more than you have in the past, don't be surprised if the credit cards recognize that and said, oh, you got a 10,000, we're going to drop it down to five. Oh, you're already at 6,500? Well, then now you're over your, 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 your limits. That's going to put even more stress on the economy and stuff for there. So let's talk about what's going to happen foreclosure-wise. Now, the default rates here, this is across the country, national average, okay, on the default rates. And Fannie Mae, FHA loans, that's your basically what people are getting to for the first time on buyer, getting two and a half, three, three and a half percent down. Those are at a 9.69% default rate. That's highest default rate above the national average. You got uh, conventional loans are the lowest at 3.16. You had VA loans at uh, 4.65. And then uh, your other loans, all of the loans average 4.36. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind, that's your first time home buyers. Those are people that got in a house, probably had their down payment donated, probably had closing costs. They showed up with very little skin in the game. That's a big cause of what happened back in 2000. I'm not saying Fannie Mae FHA loans were subprime, but it's not as credit driven as your, your conventional loans. So yes, we see a wave of foreclosures coming. What's happening is Massachusetts has kicked the can down for six months. Let's kick the can down the street for six months and see where things at. Now, obviously forbearance agreements, they talk about how forbearance agreements have dropped a little bit. This is June's numbers, not quite, don't have the July numbers yet and what the forbearance numbers are, but nationally across the country, they're dipping a little bit, but they're still at 4.7, 4.6 million, except in Massachusetts. In our article, I saw that they actually are increasing in Massachusetts, obviously because of the unemployment rate. People are like uh, living off their savings as long as they can. Well, we're gonna take a forbearance agreement now. Now, Fannie, Freddie, the government back, obviously say, oh, we're gonna extend it for a while. We're gonna give you six months and then another possible six months. Okay, six months a year before you can start foreclosing is a, is, is a thing, but Eh, does that make it a good thing if you're a real estate investor? Does that make it a good thing if you can't evict somebody for six months, but you still got to pay your mortgage as an investment property? If you look exactly, if you're an investor, the only home that falls in that more, um, mortgage restriction, that foreclosure restriction is your primary residence. Doesn't mean for investment properties, okay? So roughly, if you look across the board, about one out of, one out of eight borrowers in Massachusetts is in default. You have unemployment numbers going to be close to a million people alone in Massachusetts here. Most recent number was 900,000. Massachusetts is much higher than the national average. We saw that unemployment rate 11%, Massachusetts 17. Okay. Now the thing that will save borrowers besides the six month delay is that you will have a longer foreclosure time frame in Massachusetts. It's a judicial foreclosure, 960 days. It's one of the longer ones out there. So what does that mean? 960 days, how many years is that to foreclose? <laughs> that's for a FHA foreclosure, okay? That's another, that's a year, two years. People in Massachusetts really have about a two year window before they really have to worry about their bank foreclosing on them if they're residents. Now, you look at forbearance agreements dragging out, that could extend another six months. So you're probably not gonna see REOs hit the market. REOs are foreclosed homes at the market at a minimum of 12 months for your investment loans if not 18 or 24 months for the primary residences. That's a good thing if you're in a shitty situation. It's not a good thing if you're a local investor. It means you're waiting around at least a year, if not two years, to see the deals that start flowing in. Well, if I got two years to get my act together, heck, I could almost go back to school and get an associate's degree. I could go become a diesel mechanic and make 125 grand and get licensed to be a diesel mechanic in 12 months. Now, we all know not everybody's gonna do that. And that's gonna be bad news for the Massachusetts economy. Uh, the Attorney General, 12 years ago, was one of the, the uh, Massachusetts one of the states to cancel foreclosures overnight and delay things for 12 months. I bet we see that if it continues to get worse for Massachusetts, they're gonna do that again. Okay, so what about the commercial debt? Well, we all know commercial debt is in the crapper as well. There's so many for rent signs. Um, we talked about 50% of small business failing, if not that number increasing. If it goes on another 90 days, expect another 30% of small businesses to fail and never recover. We all know that commercial real estate's been in a boom for, for a while. Well, we all know that's done now. Um, look at some of the default numbers. One in four hotel loans are in default across the country, not just 30 days behind, but significantly behind, okay? 
a lot of hotel loans. And when you have a glutton of inventory like that, that's in default, that makes that asset class less valuable in the short term. I'll, I'll discuss more of that in a little bit. Retail loans. Retail's been on life support for a while. The malls are failing across the country. Retail spots are also in default, one out of four. 25% and that number increasing depending on who you talk to. Office vacancy is set to increase to roughly 20% nationwide. You know, when it was not when office vacancy, it was, a, it was really hard to find good office space. Office was at a premium. That's why you saw the likes of we, uh, up, uh, WeWork and Regis and executive office suites really starting to flourish. Okay, well now 20% nationwide eh, and that number is going to get worse. You're going to expect to see at least a 15% vacancy rate factor in retail and restaurant spaces. You're going to see that uh, rent rates continue to drop by 10 to 15% over the next year. Okay. That's not good if you're existingly a commercial property owner. Okay. That's not good if you're in a space and overfinanced on this stuff. Because technically, right now, if your rent rates drop by 10%, if your vacancy drops by 15%, your value decreases and most banks are financing stuff at 70% of LTV. Well, if your value drops, now that they're over 70%, they're gonna start asking for capital calls. They're gonna start coming to you and say, hey, Mr. Borrower, um, you need to make, I need to bring another 10% or 5% cash to the table to keep this loan below 70%. Well, if you're above that and you don't have the capital, what happens? You start to default and delinquency triple uh, delinquency factors, delinquency numbers all across the country and the commercial space has completely tripled. It's gotten horrible up there. Obviously, tourism, hotels, retail, offices, obviously leading the way across that. Now, what's different about this time around versus what happened 12 years ago? Last time, a lot of the CM, big uh, commercial firms were the ones financing. You have these non-bank uh, institution that were financing a lot of stuff. Well, this time around, the banks have been much more willing to finance this stuff. Roughly, uh, 60, you know, 64% of the distressed commercial risk loans were originated by commercial mortgage-backed securities back in 2007. But in 2019 and beyond here, just 21% has been financed, whereas over 53% have been financed by banks, um, especially in the distressed stuff. Over half have been financed by the banks, okay? It's just the tip of the iceberg. You're gonna see a whole tsunami of commercial real estate really hit the markets. And you can see most of the loan to value 69% for office, industrial retail, regional local banks, the average LV was between 65 and 67, what 63 for CMBS. That's what I'm saying. They don't wanna be above that 65% range. And if you start seeing values drop, that's a pretty big chunk that you've gotta to bring to the table. And we all know people don't have savings. If you've now don't, I haven't been putting money aside, as the owner, property owner, operator, you're going to be in default relatively quickly. And you can see that well, the biggest thing down here at the bottom, oops, you can see this here, the bottom here, you can step in and start providing capital to buy out some bad loans or work with current borrowers to try to reduce the You've got two situations. One, buy the debt and buy a substantial discount and then work with it, the borrower. Say, okay, let's try to work a loan mod, trial payment plan. Where are you at with your tenants? What's going on? Or, Hey, let's let me take over the property, let you walk scot free, and let me see about trying to operate the properties myself. Um, if you have, if in the commercial space, you've heard Carl Akan, huge guy, in the commercial space says it's going to blow up. It's going to be worse than 2008, and nobody's watching it. Okay, he's been shorting his stuff for months now, for last year, putting money aside because he says it's 2008 all over again down here at the bottom. You see, it's happening all over due to loans made in 2000 to shopping malls and a lot of commercial space. You have a bunch of mortgages, so the banks went out and loaned money against a lot of shopping malls, off of buildings, hotels, and retails. It's all credible institutions doing it again, okay? And what they did, those mortgages sliced and diced them and put them into the whole uh, CMVX, which is basically credit default swaps. It's the big short all over again, everybody, and it's nobody's watching it. It's going to be a lot of distressed stuff across the country. And uh, it's, it's getting higher and higher and worse and worse. We talked about 24.3% for loans and hotels, 20% in May, okay, jumping up all across the board. Even multifamily is seeing a default there for it. Banks are standing to lose $48 billion in commercial real estate loans. Now, in March, CMBS guys lost $50 billion in March because of the market dropping 
coming to a standstill. Banks are going to lose roughly about the same amount. And an article came out Friday, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, some of these bigger banks have set aside money knowing that they're going to have to cover a lot of this distressed debt. Okay. And Bank of America, if you have an idea how much their piece of the pie, there's going to be $48 billion in commercial uh, property, commercial loans hitting you know, the books in the country. Bank of America, their piece of the pie is $5.1 billion. $5.1 billion. That's a lot. Okay. Totally a lot. Uh, so where are the opportunities with all this eh, negativity? It's all this whoop, 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 wah, as properties are going to default, banks are losing loans. That's the opportunity. It's literally commercial market right now is on sale. Okay. Now, do you want to wait around for foreclosures and REOs on the residential side? No, it could take you two years. And then at that point, it, who knows what's going to happen? Okay. Fix and flips. No. Why would you buy? I want to buy a single family home for the most part, that is decreasing in value that you've got to go through the two-year process to foreclose. Rentals, no. I don't want to be a landlord right now if my tenants have six months not to pay me, if not longer. All right. The real opportunities, though, lie in the debt game. If you can um, buy the debt at a substantial discount, which you can, all right, that gives you a lot of flexibility to go back to the borrower or go back to the tenants, say, let's work out a win-win situation, Okay. Now, we're going to see in other parts of the country, or you're going to start actually seeing this in Massachusetts for the non-government-backed things, you're going to start seeing some notes that are coming out in October, November, December, fourth quarter. You're already starting to see commercial notes this quarter right now as I'm doing this video, all right? Some of the same uh, guys I've talked to the banks, they've seen more stuff come across their desk than they saw of last year. Amazing deals at discounts. I'll give you an example. It's a huge hotel in Central Park, New York, $260 million loan, 1,300 room hotel that the bank is selling for less than 20 cents on the dollar of Vogue. Yeah, now, yes, it's a crappy time right now, but as the market recovers, people start to traveling, it's the peak of the bottom. You don't buy at the top, you buy at the bottom. And the bottom, we're pretty, pretty close to it. We may have a little bit further to fall based on some people, but you need to start looking out below. When are we gonna hit that bottom? When are the opportunities to be, we're already seeing it. And then what do you do? you got to pivot. If you're buying an asset, you're going to buy a note on a commercial property, you got to expect to get a little creative with it. Just like this guy in Illinois, he bought, he had this hotel, <laughs> vacancy rate went to nothing. What do you do? He turned it into apartments for sale. Okay. Converted it into actual apartments and sold the whole damn thing for roughly about 75 million. Changed it out. Didn't have to do much. Our buddy, Garrett, uh, one of our students, Garrison Gilbert in Pennsylvania out of Maryland is doing the same thing. Turned a 55 unit hotel into a 42 bedroom apartment. The smaller hotels, the non-flagged, which means the non-shame ones, your mom pops, that are owned by a lot of people across the country, those are the ones that don't have the bailouts. They're the ones that are struggling the most, and that's a huge opportunity to step in, pick something up cheap. It's basically already built. You're going to buy it cheaper as in the debt state than you could build it, and then turn around and do a little bit of work to it to really tweak it into apartment complex. Or you'd be like this guy, uh, in downtown Denver, he had an office space, 170 unit office space. He converted it into self storage. It's already set up 10 by 10, roughly. Okay. Let's set it up where you're going to pay me monthly in, in an asset class that is still valuable in self storage right now and turn it into that. And that's a brilliant, brilliant strategy. You're seeing that taking place all across the country, including Boston. People are getting creative. Okay. So the biggest opportunity for local real estate investors is the commercial asset class under two and a half million in value being able to be flexible with tenants or bars. That comes from a quote of a buddy of mine on Wall Street. He goes, Scott, all of us big guys are looking at the five million or greater asset class. Nobody wants to look at this smaller stuff because it just doesn't worth our time. But for investors like you, ma and pa investors all across the country, not just in Boston, but across the country, that's the biggest number that hit. When I was in that same thing 12 years ago, I've already had asset managers that I haven't traded with in a few years be, reach back up to me. Hey, are you buying? I'm like, yeah, what do you got? He goes, I got a lot of stuff on, you know, a million dollars or less that I'm looking to get off our books. I'm like, what about the bigger stuff? He goes, oh, we'll be fine on the bigger stuff. It's the smaller stuff that's going to kill us. The death of a million cuts in the smaller stuff. Okay. And this asset class is going to be the biggest overlooked niche by the big boys. It will also be the biggest drain on banks who finance over half of this stuff. That's great. Yes. You can buy, you can wait around for residential stuff if you want to. Totally fine. That's what your cup of tea. But if you've ever won the opportunity to take it up a level, 
to really advance where you're at and change the asset class you go take it up a level commercial is the spot to be and now's the time to do it now are the banks in trouble oh my gosh yes so many banks are literally sweating we saw the article bank of america every bank has distressed assets and the number is going to get worse now one of the things that we look at on a quarterly basis is the Bauer Financial Report. Now, Bauer Financial is an independent third party that evaluates banks and credit unions across the country. Now, we don't look at credit unions that much. We look at banks, all right? And their quarterly report came out in June. Now, it wasn't exactly 100% to date because banks were given some time to do it, but it was pretty damn close, and we expect it, especially when it comes out next quarter, to be even worse. But if you look at the numbers now, there, we know there are thousands of banks in Massachusetts, people, you know, banks of all sizes, all types that are either... Uh, in other states that are lending there, they have offices there, or you can look at, I like to look at the states, I mean, the banks that are actually office there, that's their main part, you know, they call Massachusetts home. And out of the 3,000 plus banks on the power financial list that we look at, 70 of them are based in Massachusetts. That's their home offices in Massachusetts, okay? So when we look at those numbers and add it up, there are $585 million in 90 plus loans that are in default, basically 90 day plus. Okay, they've already been three months behind. That's a lot of money. Now, can we agree if Massachusetts just filed a six month delay for foreclosures, we know that number is gonna go a whole lot worse, right? It's almost exactly the same number in zero to 30 or 30 to 89 day delay. So here, when we look at June, July now, July is kicked in now, that number is probably closer to a billion dollars in default. People haven't paid, we know the employment has got worse. Billion, billion and a half. Okay, right now, it's basically 3.7% average of each each bank's loans are best too. Now, so it's worse for some of them, okay? Uh, basically, if you look at, there's, at the residential side, there's 203 million in single family loans that are in default, okay? So basically, less uh, roughly about 40% of the banks that have defaulted stuff, their stuff is in the commercial paper space. I mean, the residential space where 60% is commercial. Now, the two biggest... Got the two biggest banks that have the biggest amount of percentage of loans in default. Siemens Bank is running at a 19% default rate across their books. One out of five loans in default. Eek, that's not good. Okay, that's five. That's 20, basically 20% of their portfolio. That's not good. Okay, not good at all. Next biggest is Provident Bank, has a 15% default rate across their books. How do I know? Because they have to disclose the stuff to the FDIC, and that's what. Bauer Financial does, takes a look at the quarterly reports and pulls into a nice spreadsheet that I can take a look at, all right? And that's a lot of opportunity. You don't have to, look, what, what would change your, your life? I mean, chasing 100, 200, $300,000 properties that you can buy and sell and buy and flip that take forever, that right now are, are de decreasing the value people are gonna pay you. You're gonna go to the commercial side, pick up something cheap, use private money, drag it out a little bit, put, understand you're gonna buy it, cheap enough because if you do have a longer foreclosure time frame, you get a bigger discount on the asset because you're taking over that issue. All right. That's some beautiful things. You can start purchasing the debt now versus waiting around for the foreclosure. When it, uh, especially with what's going on now, if a bank is going through a two year foreclosure process, they're going to sell it for as close to value as possible. They're not going to give you the big discounts. Okay. But you, they will give you a big discount to take the debt off their books depending on location, foreclosure timeframes, values, condition, saturation, okay? Um, you can purchase the debt to control the asset for huge discounts, somewhere between 30 and 70% off, if not worse, or, or be better discounts for us, okay? Uh, and the strategy sh really should be, okay, let me see if I can't get the loan reinstated or if I can't work with the borrower with some sort of modification, trial payment plan, short sale, hey, depending on what you buy it for, it may make sense to do a short payoff, or if you want to foreclose or sell it to somebody else, sell it to other investors in the area too, if it's not something that you're interested in or it's not something that you're familiar with, okay? Or do a deed and loan cash for keys, take the property over and do whatever you want with it, okay? Uh, you can do take it over, turn it into a cash flow performing asset or turn it into an asset and, and do what you want with it. Keep it as a, a rental, sell it, owner finance it, offer up reduced rent because you bought it at a big discount. And that's the people thing. If you buy an asset at 30% of as is value right now, and the existing cap rates, we're getting somewhere 10, 10%, 8%. We bought it at 30% now, or a third. If you can even start reinstating, that's an eight cap goes to a 24 cap. Or if it just does, you buy it at 50 cents, again, we reperform, that's a you know 16% cap rate. All right? Now, 
The thing is, if you're buying a deal at a discount, you're going to probably want to get a little bit extra funding to cover some costs, foreclosure costs, things like that. Yeah, it's going to happen. But if you could pick up an asset at 40 cents on the dollar, you think an investor wouldn't fund 50 to give you a little bit of leverage to hold on to it for foreclosure costs and carrying costs? Hell yeah, they would. Because they realize riding the wave out is the important thing. The deals of, oh, we're going to buy a property and flip it in 30, 60, 90 days. Uh-uh. You need to start planning your stuff to be 12 months, at least six months, depending on what state you're in. So the other advantages of note investing is we're not mailing out postcards. Look, direct mail doesn't work with a note business. I, and no offense to those that are dropping out thousands and thousands of postcards out there. We all know investors that are doing that. You know, I never understood that. I'm going to drop $5,000 post, $5, in postcards to get a 1% to 4% response rate. And hopefully I get one deal out of a response. That doesn't make sense with what we do. We're, if you've got email, you got a LinkedIn profile, and don't mind picking the phone dollar for dollars, making some phone calls or some scripts, you can find deals. And what's the beautiful thing? Banks don't just have one property or one note. They have multiple every quarter. So if you make a connection, it can feed you every quarter until you're done, until it's the, you get through this. Or sometimes maybe it's once every six months, whatever. It's still a deal, a continuous deal flow without having to drop 5,000 each month, 5,000 this month, 5,000 this month, okay? One source can literally lead to regular deal flow. All right, that's the beautiful thing. A lot of, plus getting the a better discount, plus bigger numbers. And then when you get a list in, or as we call it a tape, spreadsheet, um, you get a big list, just cherry pick the ones you want for your portfolio. Cherry pick it. You gonna buy them all? Banks are gonna be like the point, just buy something. Can't buy it all, buy something is what they're gonna start saying. Now, if you can buy in bulk, two, three, four deals at a time, great, you're gonna get better pricing because you're taking more of their headaches off their books, okay? And yes, residential commercial deals. Just because we're talking about Boston doesn't mean that those banks are just lending in Massachusetts. If you get, there are other desirable areas across the country that most banks are lending in a lot of places, not just in one state. So it gives you a lot more flexibility besides just your local market. You can work with investors all across the country to make deals flow. Find the deals, find the investors, put them together, take your cut out of the middle, okay? Raise capital from these other investors, either fund the purchase or take the deals down. There's a lot of commercial investors out there that are looking for deals that'll keep you as part of it or you can sell it as a wholesale deal. Lots of great things out there to do. If you think about this, that there were 15 million homeowners and roughly about 5 million commercial properties in default back 2010, it's gonna be at least close to that number pretty soon. Some millions of opportunities if you know where to look, okay? So let's talk about first, because a lot of people are like, well, are there investors out there, Scott? I don't have any capital. I don't have a lot of experience. There's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. There's literally $9 trillion plus dollars in retirement funds sitting out there. Split between IRAs, 401ks. There's a lot of retirement money sitting out there, okay? Basically not making hardly anything at all zero right now. Now, if you look in the Boston market, just by South Boston, Massachusetts, we have a way of researching and finding people that have an IRA. And in Boston, there are 75,000 investors with an IRA account. No, sorry, that's not Sacramento. No, it's Boston, okay? Now that number, 75,000, basically two thirds of them have at least 150 grand or more in their accounts, okay? It's a lot of money. How much money, how many investors do you need to raise a million bucks? <laughs> Six, seven, okay? Uh, it's, I, it's, you know, I get the numbers right here, forgot to type it in. So out of the 49,000, I'm sorry, Boston itself also has 38,000 real estate investors, people that claim to be real estate investors themselves, okay? So you have plenty of people with money, 75,000 people have an IRA, out of that 49,000 have at least 150 grand, and then you have another 38,000 of investors looking for deals over here that they could snap up. Now, not all of them are looking for commercial, not all of them are for residential, but I guarantee you can put deals together. You can be a deal engineer, okay? And everybody is in the note game these days. Everybody's a borrower of some sort. If you've got a mortgage, credit card, um, auto loan, you know, student loan debt, whatever it might be, you own Bubba John down the street, 50 grand, whatever. If you're, you're all in the, dope, in the note game, but you've got money flowing out, you're paying the banks. You're the borrowers. Now, the bank always wins, everybody. You want to be the bank. And when you buy the debt, you become the bank. You become the lender and you can negotiate terms. You can do a lot of things with the borrowers, but the bank always wins. That's why it's the biggest companies out there. It's the biggest institutions. 
because they win. They're not in the fix and flip game. They're not in the landlord game. God knows they're not that stuff. They're not in the, sh the short term rental market. They're in the note game. And that's why it pays to be the bank. All right. Pays to be the bank. So how do you tap into the tsunami of debt, everybody? Well, I've been teaching real estate investors since 2010 how to tap into the debt game. Okay, I've been buying it. Like I said, about over a half a billion dollars from portfolio. I've helped thousands, and I mean that seriously, thousands of investors purchase their first note. NPN, non-performing note, is what that stands for. Okay, Whether it was residential or commercial notes, we have closed on thousands of deals. Now people close on other, other thousands of deals out there. And the people are either buying the stuff for cash flow, or they're buying it to add to their asset class, to add it to their bottom line. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with either one of those. Yeah, I like cash flow. I like having stuff coming in that pays me one, even working or living or sleeping. Now, if you want to buy one-offs, you can, or if you want to buy in bulk, there's never been another op better opportunity out there to go be looking at some portfolios of things that are going to be popping up. And we've seen trades from the low end of 25 grand or less. My cheapest one I bought was seven bucks. <laughs> Flipped it for five grand like two days later. But I've bought up to $5 million trades. I mean, I've negotiated other things for other big things, but my personal takedown is $5 million portfolio. Anywhere from one asset to 184 assets. Okay. And I didn't, the bank didn't care what my credit was. They didn't care if, that I was using other people's money. They didn't ask for earnest money. All they cared is that I could fund. Okay. All they cared that a wire would show up on the day that we agreed, either it was 30 days, 45, 60 days, 90 days after we did our due diligence and agreed on a final price. That's all they care. And you know what I did to find all these deals? I got on a phone call with them after I tracked them down on LinkedIn and I sent them an email or I negotiated back and forth and found them off some lists. Okay. Nothing difficult. This is not, I got to send out 5,000 postcards to get people to call me. No. If you make 50 phone calls or reach out to 50 asset managers, you're probably going to get in conversations with 10 to 12 of them. And out of that 10 to 12, you're probably going to find four or five of them that have a deal they need to get off their books right now. That's what I'm saying. And that number is getting worse. If you know where to look and you see the banks that have default rates, you know what your likelihood of success is if you call them and say, hey, do you have anything in your books you can get rid of? They're going to say, hell yeah. Why didn't you call a month ago? Can I send you my list now? How much can you buy? All right. Why? Because I've seen this all happen before. In 2010, when I, I sold everything I owned roughly, later part, uh, and then 2011, 12, 13, 14, I was traveling nonstop across the country, working with banks, talking with bankers, walking into their offices. Hey, what do you have in your books to get rid of? I know you've got a lot of stuff. How about take a look at it? And walking into conference, you know, rooms that were just stacked with loan files. They weren't prepared for that. And honestly, a lot of the guys that Retired after that, and then the young guys that came up, they're not prepared for what's going on right now either. They're glad the government's kicked the can down six months. That gives them a little bit of time to evaluate their portfolios to see what they can move in the fourth quarter. Oh, we're good. We can move. We got a little bit of time. It's not going to affect our bottom line because it's everybody's across the board stop. Now let's see what we can move. See who's really more likelihood. And I guarantee when we see the numbers come out in the third quarter, it's going to be a bloodbath. And it's going to get a whole lot worse. You're going to see banks really looking to move stuff. Yes, are a lot of the bigger guys going to buy a lot of stuff? Are you going to buy a portfolio from Bank of America, Chase, or Citibank? No, you're not. Okay? But there are thousands of other smaller institutions across the country that have stuff they want to get off their books. Okay? And I don't care what your focus is. If you're into single-family homes, great. You can find some of the stuff. If you're apartments, great. Hotels, definitely hotels, definitely retail office space, self-storage, mobile home parks. I don't care what the asset class is. Uh, you can really create some win-win scenarios and stories, not only for yourself, but for the borrowers or the banks or all three. Just like we've done with this couple. I mean, we've done it for years. This is just another example of what we're seeing out there. Somebody's lived in a house for 20 years, property appreciates, they take out a loan, pull a little bit of equity out to pay some bills off, to upkeep the property, and boom, what happens? The rug gets pulled out from underneath them. As the markets keep going up, as I've been saying this for two, three years, we can't keep seeing things increasing. It's got to come down at some point. We're two years overdue for a correction. Well, we got a big correction now, everybody. This bar was trying to do a loan mod for four years. We bought the note cheap enough that we were able to get them on the phone, negotiate a loan mod, trial payment plan for 12 months that turned into a full loan modification that the borrower instead of having to take 33 years to pay their mortgage off because they were three plus years behind, plus the 30 years, they paid their loan off in six years. They paid their loan off in six years and cried at the closing table when they met with my attorney. A 
bought this loan a while back. They just paid it off. It, were they perfect along the way? Now they missed a spot in the six years we had the loan. They went late twice. But I would take that bar all day long because I bought the loan so cheap enough that with what they paid the first year, it paid back my investment. So I had five plus years of profits on this deal. You know what? Great. Good for them. We're going to take our profits and move on to something else. You will see deals like this all across the country. 4.1 million borrowers right now are in default. 4.1 million Americans need somebody to help them out with. Yes, the government's kicked the can down six months or 90 days or whatever it might be. Cities are delaying things another 30 days. But at some point, the piper's got to get paid. And the banks are going to wait. And that's what makes it for huge opportunities to buy this stuff at a big discount and really keep people in their houses in win-win scenarios out there. And you can do it big or you can do it small. I don't care what your confidence level is. I will tell you this, you can go from small to big relatively quickly, just like our buddy Gene did in Indiana here, originally from, oh, he's still in Elkhart, Indiana. But when we met Gene about four years ago, he was buying onesie, twosie real estate deals here, fixing them up, rehabbing, using just what little bit of money he had saved to make some things or the profits from his deal. He's working as a hot shot driver, driving all across Indiana, Illinois, children cars, doing what he could. We spent some time with him, taught him the right ways to do deals, the, the best way to find, best way to raise capital. And you fast forward a couple of years now, I get an email from Gene and he says, hey, Scott, thank you so much for what you taught me. Because I now have uh, put a fund together. I've got over $13 million out in the market. I've closed on over 135 deals from my own portfolio. Made a difference, a two comma difference in our future. And I'm so proud of Gene and his wife and what they're doing. But he's just absolutely doing exactly what he wants and doing some big things from a guy that he's used to wearing a ball cap. That's a picture. One of the few rare pictures you'll see Gene without a ball cap on probably a Harley Davidson cap for the most part, but we love and love and we're proud of what Gene has done out there. Uh, then you add in Laura Blunk here is one of our rock stars. Laura just moved to Maryland from South, uh, South Austin. I met her. She's like many real estate investors going to the local real estate club, trying to wholesale here and there. Didn't have a lot of ca capital on the sidelines. Couldn't buy a traditional property. Here in a state, you know, Boston's got a price range right for about the same as Austin. Trying to wholesale, light rehab, subject to deals where she could and found the note business and was like, oh my gosh, I could really do this. And sure enough, they did. They bought two deals. Her and her son bought a, a couple of deals in the first month. We're working through that. In about a year, they closed down another four, 14, 13 or 14 deals. Now fast forward about two years after that, she's closed on over 100 deals and she's getting ready to close on a $4 million portfolio with roughly 100 performing notes that she's buying at 50 cents on the dollar. Performing notes at 50 cents on the dollar. The portfolio should pay her around a 20% cash and cash return, if not better. It's a beautiful day. She went from very small to very big by learning what we taught. And she's been one of our biggest cheerleaders because she loves what we teach. And we love seeing her success as well. Just like we love seeing uh, Keith Collins here. He's out of Ohio. Um, probably the oldest one of the three of those bunch, but he's got a lot of experience. He's got some real estate experience, worked in governments. Um, I think he was a mayor of a small town in Ohio at one point, but he sent me a text message the other day. He goes, Scott, just so excited. 2019 was his best year yet. Him and his wife made seven figures last year alone from applying the stuff that we taught him. The teachings, the, the strategies, how to find deals and working those out, how to become the bank. And she, he's like, I love the note business. I never had another flip unless I have to take a property back. And we're so proud of them. All three of them, great experience. But you know what I get also excited about? There's a lot of opportunity for people looking to make a name that have no experience. They don't have anything to draw from. Like our boy Raphael here. Raphael lives in San Diego, very competitive market, can't afford to buy anything out there, rents a part with his girlfriend, but wants to get into real estate investing. He's an entrepreneur, business owner out there. He owned a car detailing business. And when Corona hit, he had to lay off his full staff, 15 employees. Nobody wants to wash their car if they're not driving, stuck at home. They're not going to pay for it. They're doing it themselves because they got to stay busy. So he had to lay his whole staff off. And if it wasn't for the notes and him taking our class in December, where he immediately in two weeks, he closed on two deals. And then a couple of weeks later, he bought three more deals. So he bought five deals in his first 60 days. Two of those, the first two, he got reperforming. The bar started paying on time. So it was about a 20% return on his money. Great. And the other three, he's got two of them sold where he's going to make a nice profit. He's making it, selling them above what he paid for them in the six months. So it's a pretty good, damn good return. And then the fifth one, he's still working with the borrower on. But he's so happy he found the note business because if he didn't, he would be unemployed without a job 
and without a future. I mean, that's a little bit extreme, but he's got a whole future ahead of him now that he's like, I can learn this. I can do this. I had, he goes, I, he's got, I had zero real estate experience. So I was talking on the phone. I was like, I don't know if you'd be an ideal for this. I said, go study, go look at this. And he went and did it. And I was like, okay, go do this. He went and did it. And that's the thing. If you're coachable, if you're coachable, you can really do a lot of good, good damage, not only for yourself and your bottom lines, but for the bars out there by really helping them out. And then we're so proud of all our students that we've taught. We've helped thousands, I said thousands and thousands and thousands of investors across the country. I get throw more and more photos up of people that are closing deals. We've closed on thousands of deals our students have. And we're so excited about that. And how have they done it all? By learning how we teach. A very simple method, basically how to find, how to fund, and how to flip. It's not rocket scientists. You don't have to be a banker to understand. And yes, banks will sell to you being an individual, whether you've got no experience or a ton of experience, great. How do they do that? Well, you start, you start at some point. And so the starting point for a lot of people on their journey, their path to becoming the bank, buying deals at huge discounts is to attend our one day training called Note Weekend. And our one day training actually takes place usually about the third Saturday of the month. If you go to noteweekend.com, you can see the next slated event. Uh, it's basically a one-day thing on Saturday, 9 a.m. Central to roughly 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The whole schedule is outlined at noteweekend.com of what we teach. It's a, busy, it's a mini workshop. No, it's not a pitch fest. I will tell you that right now. I don't do pitch fests. I want to provide content. Okay? And if you'll see the schedule, you'll see that basically we're nonstop from 9 a.m. to 3, 4, 5 with only roughly two 30-minute breaks in the middle because we're covering plenty of content on there. We live stream it via Zoom like this so you can watch from the comfort of your own home or office, your laptop, even your smartphone you can watch and learn from. If you can't make it all day on Saturday because you got family, that's great. We send you the replays out Saturday night, Sunday, so you can watch those and restream them on Sunday so you don't miss out on anything. Uh, my students call it the cliff notes of note investing. You're not going to learn the note business in one day. We have a three-day, much more in-depth class, which is great. We offer that like three times a year. But this is a great way to dip your foot in the water and say, hey, this is something I like. Or this is not as difficult as I thought it out to be. And that's the one thing, well, I hear a lot of things, but that's one of the most common things I hear from people is like, Scott, you make this understandable. The way you teach, it makes it easy to understand how we can go find these deals, how we can fund them, and how we can flip them to make money, okay? And usually it's 99 bucks. We've dropped the price down to just 49 bucks. Cut it in half. It's an online class, great. It is live. Yours truly, I'm the only person teaching, so you get it all directly from it. Our next couple of events, one is uh, July 25th, which is actually the third weekend of July here from this coming out just in a few days. The next one's the third, uh, uh, third Saturday in August. I think it's the 29th. I might have the wrong date for that, but third weekend in August, third weekend in September, uh, and then I believe we're having our, our virtual workshop in October. But anyway, what do we cover? We'll talk the first part of the day, how to find these deals. I'll show you how to literally – go create a list of over 2,000 banks deep, all right? 2,000 banks with contact information that you start emailing out to and call. We'll show you how to raise capital, how to find the, fund these deals with OPM, other people's money. We'll show you how to tap into investors in your neck of the woods, in your zip code if you need to, in your county, okay? We'll talk about the different exit strategies. And with residential assets, there's roughly about 10 different ways to make money. Commercial, there's a few more ways besides the 10 to make money in notes, Okay. And no, you don't have to come up with all the ideas themselves. It is, I'll show you how to find and build or use our vendors, the, the same team members that we use for servicing and workouts and foreclosure and documentation that, you know, we'll show you and put a help you put a team together, basically a team in a box, a business in a box for a day. Okay. We'll also discuss some of the different loan trading platforms that you start looking at deals right now. All right. Literally today, Tomorrow, you start looking at deals, residential and commercial deals today, start building your system, start making offers if you need to, uh, or you start reaching out to banks and getting some better deals. And we'll talk about a whole variety of other things, your servicing, some of the legal stuff, some of the ways to find lines of credit, um, just some great stuff out there. It's literally a 20 plus page manual that comes along with it. And it's like I said, it's all for 49 bucks. So if you go to noteweekend.com and get signed up there, we can get you registered and get you rocking and rolling and be dangerous. Have you become the bank here in roughly 12, 12 hours? We can basically get you rocking along with us sooner. So we'll throw in some other bonuses. If you need us to prime the pump a little bit more, great, I'll do that. Obviously, we cut the price in half from 99 down to 49. Um, 
We'll also throw in a lot of people get intimidated by picking up the phone and calling banks. So what I've done is I've in the past, I've done this, this in June, we'll do this again uh, in July and August is we'll do a one day calling banks training. That's where I will literally call the banks for four hours and you'll be able to watch me call. You'll be able to hear, you'll be able to see who I'm calling the conversations. You'll hear those. You'll hear this just normal conversations and it, people are like, Oh my God, that was simple. Two, three, four hours flew by fast. And you know, see me call at least 50 banks in a day. Normally that runs uh, 49 just for the four hours. We'll throw that in for you. So you watch that. Oh, and you know what? We'll record it too. So if you can't join us in the middle of the day, because we usually do that on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday when the banks are open, you can watch that at your heart's content at night or afterwards. Um, we'll throw in the most recent report of the Bauer Financial List. And that list alone costs me 360 bucks to pull. So I'll send you the list. Yes, I'll send you the list. That's was the price of admission right there. Okay. You will also get a 30 minute phone call with me. Um, and that's after the class, we'll do a one day class. And I, what I always do is like, Hey, let's schedule a 30 minute phone call just to touch base with you. See where you're going, see what the next step is for you. Help you find a find your direction, which niche you want to focus on or what else are you doing and how we can kind of consolidate that. Now I charge consulting at a thousand dollars an hour. All right. The half hour is 500 bucks. Okay. Now people always ask me, well, Scott, I can't make the full day on Saturday. I'm going to make a chunk of it. That's okay. Guess what? We throw in the replays with you. It's included. Replays are included, not extra. Well, what if my spouse or business partner, can they watch too? Yeah, we'll let them watch as well. Okay. Along with that, uh, we have a private Facebook group with roughly about 900 plus members. Great group to network, find other investors, bounce ideas, ask questions. It's a really interactive group and I absolutely love it. And so all that's over a thousand dollars in included bonuses. All right. That's all thrown in there. And no additional cost. Like I said, the class, the one day calling banks, the Bauer financial list, 30 minute coaching call with me, replays, bring your spouse, a partner, private Facebook group asset access. That's all for just 49 bucks. My biggest goal, as I said, in the front end side is I want to help create a thousand investors in the next 12 months. And this is the place we start. 49 bucks guys, trust me. It's a great way. If at the end of the first session, you're like, this isn't for me, that's fine. I'll refund your money back and let you get you on your merry way. Okay. I don't want to work with people that aren't motivated. If you're going to be focused on other things, save your money, and go do something else. I don't take offense to that. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but if you really want to learn the note business, like the other thousands of students we've helped who have made thousands and thousands and sometimes two commas, I can't guarantee success. I don't know your work, you know, your work strategy, your work ethic. This is not a get rich quick by any means. Okay. You still have to do the work. You still got to show up. You still got to send the emails. You still got to jump on LinkedIn. But I'll show you if you've got five hours, 10 hours, or 20 hours a week, we've got a different plan of level for you guys that you can, things you can be doing to be finding deals in your inbox. No direct mail costs and none of that stuff, okay? So why just should you do this? Why should you sign up tonight, today, this morning, whenever you're watching this? Yeah, learn how to help borrowers and investors. That's obvious. Help yourself, help others, okay? Make money. Who doesn't want to make money? All right, duh. Do you want to wait 12 months to find REO deals? Are you tired of overpaying for assets or properties or foreclosures because it's too damn expensive and there's less deal flow? The reason there's less deal flow, everybody, is banks aren't waiting for the foreclosures. They're selling it to guys like you and me, six to 12 months ahead of you. If you're a REO, a HUD broker, a HUD buyer, a REO agent, you're fighting over scraps, the scraps, the crumbs of the crumbs, the morsels, the grains of the grains, not the tsunami of deal flow that we see. This is the opportunity, if you've ever wanted one, to build wealth. If you'll stick with it, we get rocking into it, this is an opportunity. If you don't like Boston or you don't like Massachusetts, great. We got, there's a ton of other states and other markets that have other deals as well, too. And it's different across the country. So we all, are, we all currently know distressed borrowers, distressed property owners. Hey, here's the opportunity to step in and help tell them what to do, help them out. Maybe you can buy their note. Yeah, it's a little rarity but you can still buy deals and help people all across the country make things. And like I said, <clears throat> nothing greater than helping someone overcome an obstacle or achieve a goal or dream that they might thought was that they thought was impossible. Now, if you're sitting there, one of the people that are struggling, one of the people that's on in a forbearance agreement or defaulted or laid off and you're looking for something to do, here you go. Ring, ring. The phone's for you. God is calling you. Hey, here's your opportunity. Here's your opportunity to learn, to invest in yourself and come out smelling a whole lot so we feel stick to it. Stick to it, do the things that we teach. You either do it on a part-time basis, full-time basis, 
buy a one-off. Look, if you really want to build cash flow, you want to build wealth, this is the opportunity for you like so many people. We've had some major, major wealth transfers over the last 30 years. The RTC days of the 80s, which is the savings and loan scandal. We've seen what happened 10 years ago with the Great Recession. And you know what? Right now is the opportunity for most people out there to take advantage. Either you or somebody else is going to do it. It might as well be you putting the money in your pocket. Okay? So once again, get signed up tonight by going to noteweekend.com. One day with me. Live streaming on Saturday Live. Yes, live Q&A. It's not just a one-way street. I like to ask questions. Replays are included. Like I said, it's Cliff Notes. Great way to find you. A great way. Cheat, cheating into the note business, as I like to say, how to buy pennies and learn to steal legally from assets. Just 49 bucks. Small time investment for you for a wealth of knowledge that can last you a lifetime. Your real estate business. Once again, July 25th, Saturday, August 23rd is actually right. That's right. And then we'll do it the third Saturday of the month in, in September and October. So love for you to be a part of that. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask for you. Have any questions or comments or concerns? All right. Thank you so much for being a part of it and uh, be safe out there, everybody. We'll see you all at the top. Hope to see you this Saturday.